Are you, are you coming to the tree with a strong upper man? The same murder three. Strange things did happen here. No stranger would it be if we met at midnight in the hanging tree. Coffee. Without it, we would never have had the Industrial Revolution. We'd all be still living in Europe in mud huts. Here in Laredo, we have the Organic Man Coffee Trike. 4501 McPherson, the best coffee on the planet. If you can't get to Laredo, you can order from the Organic Man Coffee Trike dot shop. And welcome to the show. I'm your host, Chris James. If you want a cool t-shirt or a coffee cup, maybe a shoulder bag, check out tpublic.com. Search for strange things and see what's there. It might be too early to start your 2022 Christmas shopping, but mm, how about some birthday presents? David Subeth sent me a message asking about the Soviet cosmonauts that may have died in outer space. I had just started working on the show about the moon, so I scheduled cosmonauts for this week. I do not speak Russian. Some of these names are going to be mispronounced. Sorry. I do have a few listeners in Russia, so I hope I still have them this time next week. I started out trying to get everything into chronological order. Many of the incidents overlapped, making this impossible. Finally, I just wrote out my notes and hoped for the best. There are dozens of websites with information on cosmonauts dying in outer space. Most of them had the same information. Uh, some were word for word, while others told strikingly different stories about the same events. It took way too long to sift out what I could. The naysayers outnumber the others ten to one. If you type in cosmonauts who died in outer space, you'll get a zero. There were few fatalities listed as re-entry or launch pad deaths. If you keep searching, you can find stories about all kinds of bad things going on as the Soviets and the United States raced each other to reach the moon. I'm not going to get into whether NASA got there in 1969 or much later. I did that last week. Uh, if you keep searching, you can find stories about all kinds of things that happened between the two countries. A lot of websites will say, ah, but this never happened. It's all just conspiracy theory. Then you find others that will swear what they say is true. I'm just going to try and focus on the folks involved in the space race cosmonauts, and what may have been some of their more tragic accidents. Uh, some of what I'm saying may be wrong or false. I found sites that swore their information was true on both sides of the question. Some people believe we should not know what all went on during the history of the space race. Who cares? It's old history. Some people don't want to know the truth. I'm going to go with the idea that the Soviets were about as forthcoming and honest as the NASA folks, which I'll bet you can guess how I believe them. The Soviets didn't have an agency like NASA running things. They had a bunch of bureaucrats spread out all over the country putting their two cents worth in, the rockets themselves were managed under the Soviet space program, which was run by the military. I'm just going to call them the Soviets from here on, 
simply because calling it the Soviet military space program is just a little too long. The space race was the period between 1955-1972, and it saw both the Soviet Union and the U.S. pushing their scientists, researchers, to the limits as they tried to determine whether communism or democracy was better equipped for blasting people into orbit. The Soviets were in the lead from the start. First artificial satellite, a first man in space, first woman in space, a just maybe the first death in space. <clears throat> NASA was playing catch-up from the beginning. Not trusting each other, the U.S. and the Soviets kept things secret. They kept things secret from each other as well as from their own people. The scientists, on the other hand, knew each other and they sent letters back and forth talking about what they were doing and whether it worked or not. Both countries wanted the world to believe everything they were doing was okie-dokie and everything the other guy was doing was evil and bad. If they couldn't find bad things to talk about, they made things up. Uh, kind of like our politicians. And come to think of it, politicians the world over tend to tell half-truths and outright lies. Why is that? When winning becomes more important than the health and well-being of the people around you, uh, there's something wrong. In an effort to win, both sides cut corners and took unreasonable risks. As Alan Shepard sat in his space capsule waiting to be fired into the void, he looked around and he realized everything he could see was made by the lowest bidder. In other words, the cheapest parts put together by the cheapest workers who were in a huge hurry to beat the other guys. There are some things you don't want to save money on. Anything your life depends on should be put together with skill and quality. Uh, just think how things would have gone if Noah had dealt with the lowest bidders. Both governments would go to extraordinary lengths to save money while at the same time throwing tons of money away on bizarre things. The guys sitting behind the desk seemed to get all the perks while the people risking their lives got to work with low-budget equipment. The people making the decisions on where to save money and cut corners were never the ones paying for the mistakes. In 1960, science fiction writer Robert Heinlein said that while he was traveling in the USSR, he met Red Army cadets who told him that there had recently been a manned space launch. The capsule was the Korobol Sputnik 1. The capsule experienced a mechanical failure when the guidance system steering it in the wrong direction. This made retrieval of the capsule impossible, and the horrible Sputnik 1 was stranded in orbit around the Earth. The Soviets officially claimed the launch was an unmanned test flight, but according to Heinlein, there might have been a cosmonaut inside the capsule. To lend some evidence to Heinlein's theory, uh, two Italian amateur radio operators picked up a number of radio transmissions that they said were from a doomed Soviet cosmonaut. Achille and Giovanni Giudica Cordiglia, Cordiglia, a pair of brothers from Turin, said they began monitoring the Soviet space program transmissions in 1957 that these transmissions proved that Yuri Gagarin wasn't actually the first man in space. Uh, back then, there was no such thing as encrypted radio. Everything was sent out over the same set of airwaves, either using Morse code or plain speech. 
Alexei Ledovsky was one of the early cosmonauts being trained for the space race. According to the Italians, he was killed in a suborbital flight November 1957. November 1960, the brothers told about picking up an SOS transmission in Morse code uh, coming from a Soviet spacecraft. Uh, based on the transmissions, they determined that the craft was moving away from Earth instead of orbiting, which meant that the Soviets had accidentally launched their cosmonaut deep into space. Uh, the brothers eventually made nine recordings that they said were emergency transmissions from Soviet cosmonauts who were launched into space only to fail getting their orbit trajectory, and they were slowly drifting away from our planet. In one of the recordings, a woman's voice could be heard speaking in Russian, uh, saying that she could see flames as she was asking Mission Control if her ship was going to explode. If the recordings are real, it means the first woman in space was launched by the Soviets, becoming the first woman in space as well as the first woman to die there. A high-ranking Czechoslovakian leader came out with information concerning Maria Gromova, a female cosmonaut that died while in outer space. The time and location are the same, so this may have been who the two Italian brothers were hearing on their radio. Naturally, the Soviets denied all of these allegations. Uh, kind of like how folks at NASA tend to bend or ignore the truth as well. There are several websites that say none of this ever happened, that the two Italian brothers were basically lying. Then again, there are also several that say they did record all these messages. Who do we believe? Uh, books have been written telling about cosmonauts who died while trying to win the space race. Uh, folks immediately came out saying that the writer was full of it. Uh, TV shows have come out showing what the folks in charge want us to believe. I'll let you to decide who to believe or who you think might just be pulling your chain. One explanation bandied about was that the Soviets had sent recorded voices into space uh, so they could test out radio equipment and transmitters to see if voices could be picked up coming from outer space. This was just a theory that people threw around to see if others would believe it. In 1960, a Soviet rocket ignited on the launch pad, killing at least 78 of the ground crew. Uh, shortcuts were leading to all manner of deaths. In October of the same year, 150 people were incinerated on a launch pad after an explosion of an R-16 ballistic missile. The disaster later named the Nedelin catastrophe after the chief marshal of the artillery who was killed in the accident was quickly shrouded in a veil of official secrecy. It wasn't until 39 years later, 1989, as communism began to fall apart in the Soviet Union, that the truth was finally acknowledged by the Soviet government. The death of a young fighter pilot Valentin Bendorenko, in a fire during cosmonaut training in 1971, was also concealed by the USSR until 1986. In 1961, a Soviet cosmonaut was killed when a devastating fire erupted inside an oxygen-rich training capsule. This was six years before Apollo 1 burned up for the same reason in 1967. And NASA must have known about the Soviet fire. Did they ignore this information, or was there some other reason Apollo 1 was filled with oxygen for that test? 
Before sending people into outer space, the scientists wanted to know how high they could get and could they get them back down. Balloons were used to take men into the extreme reaches of the atmosphere. Once there, the men would jump using parachutes to hopefully get back home alive. As three men had been sent up to test out parachutes for the cosmonauts. Official records state that Dolgov was killed on November 1, 1962, while carrying out a high-altitude parachute jump from a Volga balloon gondola. A Dolgov jumped at an altitude of 93,960 feet. The helmeted visor of Delgov's so-called spacesuit hit part of the gondola as he exited, depressurizing the suit and killing him. Another man named Kachur is known to have disappeared around the same time. His name has been linked to an equipment failure as well. A Grochov is also thought to have been involved with Dolgov and Kuchar in high-altitude t- uh, test equipment failures. These men were not cosmonauts, but they were involved in the space program. Over the years, their stories became associated with outer space, and their deaths were supposed to have happened while in orbit. The boys at NASA loved using anything to make the Soviets look bad. When word got out about the three parachutists dying, they all suddenly became cosmonauts who had died in outer space. Alexei Bolokhanov, Bolokhanov, a retired high-altitude parachutist, knew the three men, and he tried to set the record straight. He wrote articles and he mailed them to folks like William Randolph Hearst saying that the men did die in the service of the space program, but they were not cosmonauts. They were testing parachutes. Well, Hearst simply ignored these letters, as did NASA. Vladimir Ilushin was the son of one of the Soviet Union's best-known aircraft designers, Sergei Ilushin. Uh, During the 1960s, Sergei Ilushin was a politically powerful figure, a deputy leader of the Soviet Supreme, and a recipient of three medals as a hero of the Soviet Union. Uh, Vladimir was one of the most distinguished Soviet test pilots. In 1959, he set the world's altitude record, reaching 98,000 feet in his Sukhoi 9 jet fighter. In 1960, he received the Hero of the Soviet Union medal for his high-altitude and high-speed test flights. Vladimir Ilushin did not join the cosmonaut corps right away. He was focused on reaching the highest altitude possible instead. Well, then it dawned on him. As soon as some cosmonaut went into outer space, all of his high-altitude records would become meaningless. Having a super-powerful dad, Vladimir was allowed to join the space program and move to the top of his class. Even though the others had a year's head start on him, Vladimir was slated to be one of the first cosmonauts in space. There are lots of photographs from 1961 showing him suddenly as a member of the cosmonaut class. February 2, 1961, a secret launch took place sending one of the other cosmonauts into space. As something went wrong during the early part of that flight, and the pilot became unconscious. The space capsule continued orbiting the Earth as the folks on Earth tried to wake the stranded uh, cosmonaut. He did regain consciousness, only after it was apparent any return to Earth would force him down over China. 
The capsule continued circling as the lab coats tried to figure out what to do. Somewhere around orbit number 17, the cosmonaut stopped responding. The capsule couldn't be controlled from Soviet missile control, mission control anymore. It continued orbiting, slowly moving farther away. It is said somewhere out there is a Soviet spaceship with a dead cosmonaut still floating around. Images drawn up over the years show a skeleton in a spacesuit. In the freezing cold of space, I doubt the body would have dissolved. It would probably become very desiccated and look kind of like a mummy, but it would look more like a mummy in a spacesuit than a skeleton. <clears throat> a Vladimir Lucian was scheduled for the following flight. The fault causing unconsciousness was supposed to have been rectified. His capsule, named the Rishia, Rishia? R O S S I Y A, like I said, I don't speak Russian, Rosaya, well, maybe that's it. It was launched on the morning of April 7, 1961. Once again, something in the capsule went wrong. Before completing the first orbit, the pilot stopped responding to radio calls for mission control. Illusion had lost consciousness, which was a repeat of the February mission. Once again, after a few minutes, the frantic waiting, the cosmonaut was still unconscious. Both the Soviet Union and China were communist countries. Their leaders and politicians wanted to destroy the United States, or at least beat the pants off of it, in any kind of a project. They were not fond of each other, either. Both communist countries thought their opposite members should be removed and replaced by like-minded folks from their own country. The border between these three countries is heavily patrolled and weaponized. Any old Soviet tanks that can no longer be driven are parked along the border and they are manned by two crewmen, a gunner and a loader, and that's it. A Vladimir had no idea what was going on in order to save his life. Due to the high profile of the pilot, it was decided to attempt an emergency landing during the third orbit. As a consequence, his space capsule would touch down in mainland China. The scientists hit the button that brought the capsule out of orbit and began re-entry maneuvers. Normal procedures for the Vostok landings called for ejection of the pilot from the capsule at about 20,000 feet, with the pilot touching down using his own parachute. Being unconscious, Vladimir Lushin was unable to eject from the Roshaya and sustained very serious injuries when the capsule hit the ground. He was badly hurt, but he was alive, gaining the honor of being the first man to return alive from orbit. The capsule successfully landed in an uninhabited countryside and was immediately swarmed by Chinese soldiers. A Vladimir Lushin was taken into custody, and a long, drawn-out negotiation for prisoner exchange was begun. China had the upper hand, but there wasn't much they wanted to get from the Soviets. I think mostly they were just trying to embarrass them. The Chinese authorities hospitalized Lushin, and they kept him in China for a year as their honored guest which was a euphemism reserved to describe foreign intelligence agents. By the time of his emergency landing, news had leaked out among foreign communist correspondents in Moscow that a manned spaceflight was either ongoing or imminent. Just one day after Aleutian's failed mission, a hurried decision was made in Moscow to launch the backup pilot, Yuri Gagarin. 
Gagarin's flight almost ended in tragedy as well. At the time set for deorbiting, the descent capsule failed to disconnect from the service module. After several unsuccessful attempts, the landing craft finally was able to separate, but they don't know why. It just kind of broke loose on its own. The deorbiting maneuver had occurred nearly 10 minutes after its intended time, and Gagarin landed in a remote area away from the recovery team. Regardless of his close call, the mission was at last a success and Gagarin's flight captured the attention of the world and it effectively succeeded in covering up Ilushin's aborted mission. A Vladimir Ilushin recovered from the accident and was returned to the Soviet Union in 1962. He became a test pilot for the Sukhoi Design Bureau. But... His flight into outer space and his landing on Earth were all covered up. Why did Gagarin get the credit as the first man in space? Well, had the Soviets said that Vladimir was the first man in space, they would then have to tell the world that he lost consciousness, had to be brought back to Earth by remote control, uh, spent a year as a prisoner of China. Once again, the naysayers will tell you this never happened. The Daily Worker, a British communist newspaper with connections to the Kremlin, reported on the 12th that the launch had actually occurred the previous Friday. The newspaper claimed, according to its sources, that the flight was a success, but the return to Earth had gone wrong and the co cosmonaut had landed far off course and was badly injured. To cover up the disappearance of the test pilot turned cosmonaut, the Daily Worker ran a second article saying that Aleutian had been injured in a car crash and this was why he was no longer seen or heard from for about a year. They simply ignored the earlier story about him coming down in China. A 1961 cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin became the first man in space, at least that's the official story. Uh, some folks say the Soviets reached outer space on several earlier missions, but covered them up because they lost the cosmonauts. There may have been as many as four failed flights, not including Vladimir. Gagarin orbited our planet just one time, taking 108 minutes. He reached a maximum height of 203 miles. Uh, during the flight, he ate, drank, and he monitored onboard systems. The Federation Aeronautic Internationale, or FAI, is the world's air sports federation. It was founded in 1905 as a non-governmental, non-profit-making international organization to further aeronautical and astronautical activities. Among its duties, the FAI certifies and registers records. Its first records in aviation date back to 1906. The organization also arbitrates disputes over records. If nationals from two different countries claim a record, it is the FAI's job to examine and submit documentation and make a ruling as to who has accomplished the feat first. When it was apparent the United States and the Soviets were planning to launch men into space, the FAI specified spaceflight guidelines. One of the stipulations that the FAI carried over from aviation was that the spacecraft pilot, like aircraft pilots, should land inside their craft in order for the record to be valid. In the case of aviation, this made sense. Nobody wanted to encourage pilots to sacrifice themselves for an aviation record. 
piloting an aircraft that could not land did nothing to further aeronautical engineering. When Yuri Gagarin orbited the Earth on April 12, 1961, the plan had never been for him to land inside the Vostok spacecraft. His spherical re-entry capsule came through the Earth's atmosphere on a ballistic trajectory. Soviet engineers had not yet perfected a braking system that would slow the craft sufficiently for a human to survive impact without sustaining serious if not deadly injury. They decided to eject the cosmonaut from his craft. Yuri Gagarin ejected at 20,000 feet, landed safely on Earth. As Soviet engineers had not discussed this shortcoming with the Soviet delegates to the FAI prior to his flight. They prepared their documents for the FAI, omitting this fact. This led to everybody believing that Gagarin had landed inside his spacecraft. It was not until four months later when Germain Titov became the second human to orbit the Earth and the first person to spend a full day in space when the controversy began to brew. Titov owned up to ejecting himself. This led to a special meeting of the delegates to the FAI to re-examine Gagarin's and Titov's spice flight records. The conclusion of the delegates was to rework the parameters of human spaceflight to recognize that the great technological accomplishment of spaceflight was to launch, orbit, and safe return of the human, not the manner in which he or she landed. Gagarin and Titov's records remained on the FAI books. Even after Soviet-made models of the Vostok spacecraft made it clear that the craft had no braking capability, the FIA created the Gagarin Medal that it awards annually to the greatest aviation or space achievements of that year. So the Soviets bent the rules a bit. The idea was to get a human into space and then back on the ground, still alive. The Soviets landed their space capsules on land, whereas NASA used the oceans to catch the returning spacecraft. Gagarin became an overnight sensation. He was paraded around the USSR like a rock star. The Soviets decided he was too valuable to risk during anything dangerous, so they wouldn't let him fly or participate in any kind of dangerous training. This led to Gagarin drinking a lot. At such a young age, his career was pretty much over. He did that one thing, and now he was expected to spend the rest of his life talking about it. My cats are knocking things off of shelves in the background. Like anyone being kept from doing what they loved, he was being paraded around like an old man. 1967, a plan was launched to place two Soviet space capsules in orbit at the same time. One cosmonaut would launch into space, uh, followed by two cosmonauts in the second spacecraft of the next day. The two craft would rendezvous, and one of the cosmonauts would switch places with one of the others. Yuri Gagarin, his best friend of Vladimir Komarov and a third cosmonaut looked over the two craft and they all decided the launch was a bad idea and it should be delayed until the craft could be fixed. Leonid Brezhnev said the mission was going to launch as planned and nobody was willing to risk telling him no. Uh, folks who told Brezhnev bad things tended to get reassigned to horrible locations or uh, completely lose their jobs. The old killing the messenger was unknown to him. 
Now, Komarov told his friends he was going to die in space, but he was going ahead with the launch because if he didn't, Gagarin would have to go in his place. To save his friend's life, he clomb into the crappy space capsule and was rocketed into outer space. Now, Komarov was heard on U.S. listening posts as he communicated with his bosses. It was not a nice conversation. Apparently, Komarov had found his space capsule to be less than adequate. It leaked everything. It leaked fuel. It leaked oxygen. The parts were falling off. It was the product of rushing to win despite the cost. It wasn't until Komarov was re-entering the Earth's atmosphere that he discovered the heat shield and the parachutes didn't work either. According to those listening, he cursed out the scientists and the military leaders that sent him to his death. The second launch was delayed and Gagarin managed to live to try again later. What was buried didn't even look human. Vladimir Komarov's death seemed to have been almost scripted. Yuri Gagarin said as much in an interview he gave to the Pravda weeks after the crash. He sharply criticized the officials who had let his friend fly. Rumors would later swirl that the spacecraft had hundreds of structural problems before it took off, and at least some high-ranking Soviet delegate deliberately ignored the warnings from the engineers and the cosmonauts. They were willing to throw the dice and see what happened, since it wasn't them sitting in the capsule. When his best friend died in that failed launch, Gagarin gave up drinking. He recommitted himself to flying and even participated in aerospace engineering in hopes of helping to create a safe and reusable spacecraft. In 1968, the famed pilot and cosmonaut took off on a routine training flight in a MiG-15. Shortly thereafter, the plane crashed near the town of Kirsoch, both Gagarin and the flight instructor, Vladimir Sirigin, uh, perished. Gagarin was 32 at the time. Immediately, the Soviets rushed to gloss over the incident, covering up details of the incident for decades. In 2013, new evidence emerged. The crash was supposed to have been caused by an error in traffic control. During the fateful flight, the Soviet Su-15, a much larger jet fighter than the MiG-15, violated Gagarin's airspace. The turbulence caused Gagarin to lose control and ultimately plunge to his death. Gagarin had publicly criticized the Soviet space program. There are those who believe this was no accident. Some believe the Su-15 was flown close to the MiG on purpose to cause the crash. Both sides of the space race had their problems, but neither side was willing to admit it. Both sides had their critics who met with untimely deaths. When I was growing up, we were told the Soviets were evil people who wanted to kill us just because we were different. In the army, we studied Soviet tanks, so we knew who to shoot at. We had playing cards with Soviet tank silhouettes. They even taught us a few Russian phrases like, hands up and don't shoot. It turns out that was all just a bunch of garbage. Governments might hate each other, but the citizens seldom do. Most of the time, the citizens just want to get on with their lives and uh, do what they wanted to do. And all that hating the other guy, well, that's just nasty political nonsense. I already ranted about our Nazis beating their Nazis to the moon, so no more of that. 
for now. The Soyuz 2 was said to be an unmanned spacecraft that was the docking target for Soyuz 3. There are some reports that say that Ivan Ishtonikov and his dog Kloka were manning the Soyuz 2. The pair had been sent into outer space to see if humans and animals could survive for an extended time. They disappeared on October 26, 1968, with signs that the Soyuz 2 had been hit by a meteor. Ishtonikov was erased from every photograph of cosmonauts and all of his files were destroyed. The Soviets didn't want anybody to find out about this failure. As men and women were chosen for the space program, they would get, be gathered together, all smiles and confidence, to get their photos taken. These photos would be published in newspapers and magazines. As time went by, some of these same photos would be reprinted. A look would show people had been removed. This was long before Photoshop. Instead, somebody would take a fine-tipped paintbrush and carefully paint over the cosmonauts that, for unknown reasons, were no longer participating. Some had died, either in tests or possibly in orbit. Others had gotten into trouble, uh, drinking, fighting, carousing about. They didn't want any black marks on the space program, so anybody that didn't behave or died unexpectedly, they just erased them. Why go, so, go to, through so much effort to change photographs of historic mo moments? A photo of the original Mercury astronauts might not look too odd with Gus Grissom removed. He was in the back center. However... If you remove John Glenn, the photo would look kind of weird. Many of the missing cosmonauts had their records erased as well. The school would no longer list certain names, who they were, or what had happened to them. News articles and magazine stories were no longer available. It would probably have been easier to say that one or two of the cosmonauts had died in a car crash, or maybe they fell off a cliff while mountain climbing. Instead, it was policy to doctor photos and gather up all the old records to hide them away. Cosmonauts were considered to be almost more than human. They were supposed to die, they were not supposed to die in ordinary accidents. Andrea Mikoyan was reportedly killed together with a second crew member in an attempt to reach the moon ahead of the Americans in early 1969. Due to system malfunctions, they failed to get into lunar orbit and they shot past the moon. Their space capsule kept going, heading for the edge of the solar system. There's no report on how long the pair might have survived as they got further and farther from the Earth. The spaceship might still be drifting around out there somewhere between the Earth and Pluto. As Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin were en route to the moon, a Soviet spacecraft was almost there already. The Luna 15 was closing in on the finish line while our spaceship was still rounding the last curve. The Soviets said that this was an unmanned craft. It was going to land, pick up some rocks, blast off, and return to the Earth so the Soviets could show the world they had moon rocks before the U.S. was able to get home. A Luna 15 was already in orbit as Apollo 11 was approaching the moon. The landing orders were sent, but the Soviet craft didn't respond. There was some unforeseen glitch that delayed the landing until the Eagle had already set down. Armstrong and Aldrin landed July 20, 1969. 
They spent 21 hours and 36 minutes on the surface before launching the return to the command craft. On July 21st, the Soviet craft was taken out of orbit and began its landing maneuvers. The plan was to land, scoop up some rocks, launch and return without bothering to take any precautions. The Soviet landing craft headed for the surface. It didn't slow down. Instead of landing, it crashed into a mountain next to the Sea of Crisis. What an appropriate name. The boys at NASA found out about Luna 15 already being in orbit as a Apollo 11 pulled into orbit. The people at Mission Control were worried that either the Soviet craft might interfere with communications or the, the two spacecraft might run into each other. Apollo 8 astronaut Frank Borman had met Soviet space official Stislav Keldysh. Borman called Keldysh and asked if there was any danger to the Eagle or the Columbia. Keldysh telegraphed the orbital details for Luna 15 and said it would be a safe transit for the U.S. astronauts. Now, he didn't divulge the mission details. That was still officially uh, secret. But he was willing to tell NASA all the details about when and where the Soviet spacecraft would be. Way back when I was a firefighter, I heard about a Soviet spacecraft crashing on the moon. Our fire station was about three, four miles from Johnson Space Center. The spacecraft, the Soviet spacecraft that crashed on the moon, was supposed to have been occupied by either three or five cosmonauts. The story I heard was that they had beat Apollo 11 by a few days, or the cosmonauts arrived a day later. It just depended on which NASA employee I was talking to. The U.S. craft was made up of two parts. There was the landing craft, called the Eagle, and there was the command module, called the Columbia. The Soviets had a one-piece spacecraft. It would do both parts, landing and returning. In a rush to beat the U.S., the Soviet craft was unable to slow down. It impacted the lunar surface, killing all on board. Once again, the naysayers will tell you this never happened. They say a lot of things I don't believe. The only way we'll ever know for sure is if we, that's you and I, go to the moon and have a look for ourselves. Photos just won't do since both sides have had a history of changing images before showing them to us. In another slant on the same story, some folks say that Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin found a crashed Soviet spacecraft on the moon. Inside the wreckage, they found several dead cosmonauts. And NASA immediately put a gag order on the entire affair. Then there is a story of Apollo 11 finding dead cosmonauts on the surface of the moon. One having a camera with footage of cosmonauts landing on the moon, raising the Soviet flag, and then all dying from unknown causes. The whole idea of Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin finding a crashed spaceship or any cosmonauts is just a little too much to handle. The Eagle only had enough fuel to launch and return to the Columbia. Finding the remains of the Soviet moon landing in one day would be like finding a crashed airplane somewhere in the United States by mere chance. As soon as Apollo 11 entered the orbit of the moon, the Soviet Space Command began saying they had never really planned on going to the moon. They tried to act as if the space race really wasn't a thing. The crew of Soyuz 11 had spent 23 days in orbit on board the Soviet space station. 
The plan was for this to be the Soviets' answer to Apollo 11, beating them to the moon. A huge publicity campaign was planned, and it was about to get started. On June 30, 1971, the Soviet retrieval team was standing by for the return of the Soyuz 11 cosmonauts in a remote section of Kazakhstan. A recovery helicopter spotted the spacecraft as it drifted to the ground. The recovery team followed the chopper's directions and they found the capsule. Everything looked normal as they approached the spacecraft. The team opened the hatch, only to find the crew were all dead. A cosmonauts Grigory Debovsky, Vladislav Volkov, and Viktor Patsayev had died sometime between their last contact with mission control and their landing. A Tom Stanford, the chief of NASA's aeronaut corps, uh, astronaut corps, believed that the physiological stress of their long flight is what caused the cosmonauts' demise. NASA physician Chuck Berry theorized that it was not the physiological cause, but that a toxic substance of some kind found its way into the descent module. It wasn't until 1973 that NASA found out the true cause of the cosmonauts' deaths. There was a ruptured breathing valve that caused the men to die of decompression. The result of a sudden, large drop in air pressure, causing the air in their lungs to expand, killing all three men. The autopsies concluded the valve had malfunctioned while the capsule was still outside the Earth's atmosphere. The spacecraft was fully automatic, so even with the entire crew dead, it went through all the maneuvers needed to return to Earth. These would be three official deaths that did take place in outer space, yet the naysayers will still tell you that no cosmonauts died in outer space. The Fallen Astronaut Memorial on the Moon includes the names of most of the known astronauts and cosmonauts who were killed before 1971. Astronaut David Scott secretly placed the fallen astronaut statue on the moon during the Apollo 15 mission. Near the completion of his work on August 1, 1971, along with a plaque bearing the names of eight American astronauts and six Soviet cosmonauts who had died in service. The fallen astronaut statuette was created by Belgian sculptor, painter, and printmaker Paul van Hoydonk. It is three and a half inches aluminum sculpture, a small stylized figure meant to depict an astronaut in a spacesuit. If you look at it, you won't think a U.S. astronaut. You won't think Soviet cosmonaut. You'll just think this is somebody in a spacesuit. Before the mission, Commander David Scott met with Van Hoindonk at a dinner party. It was there agreed that Van Hoindonk would create a small statuette for Scott to place on the moon. It had to be small enough to be smuggled on board the Apollo spacecraft. It had to be easily put inside a pocket of the spacesuit, and it had to be removable all at the same time. As Scott's purpose was to commemorate those astronauts and cosmonauts who had lost their lives in the furtherance of space exploration. He also designed and separately made a plaque listing the 14 American astronauts and Soviet cosmonauts' names who lost their lives in the pursuit of space exploration. This was a big thing to the astronauts, but it wasn't a thing to NASA. They pretty much didn't want anything to do with it. I used to live on NASA Road 1, five miles from Johnson Space Center. I knew a lot of folks who worked there. 
some of them had some interesting and bizarre stories uh, coming from the other side of the planet. As far as I know, no United States astronauts died in outer space. Eighteen astronauts were killed in four separate incidents. During the X-15 Flight 191, Michael Adams had an electrical problem followed by control problems at the apogee of his flight. As the experimental craft was coming back down, it began to break up at 65,000 feet. Adams was posthumously awarded astronaut wings, as his flight had passed the 50-mile altitude. Apollo 1 burned up on the launch pad, killing three astronauts. A space shuttle Challenger was destroyed 73 seconds after liftoff, and space shuttle Columbia was lost as it returned from a two-week mission. This is the official number from NASA. As for cosmonauts, the numbers are uncertain since there was so much secrecy during the space race. If you believe the folks who constantly bend the truth, there's not much I can say to change your mind. If you don't believe them, uh, try a bit of research on your own. See what you can find. The major trouble with investigations today is there's so many people all trying to get their version of the truth out. Space exploration is a dangerous endeavor. The vacuum of space will kill any human. The lack of oxygen doesn't help. It is super cold out there, running at 454 degrees below zero Fahrenheit. The folks who volunteered to boldly go were either the bravest people on earth or just a few steps away from being crazy, or maybe both. Placing your health and well-being in the hands of a bunch of politicians who don't care for anything outside their own personal sphere is not a really good idea. Climbing aboard a tin can built by the lowest bidder using the cheapest parts available sounds crazy to me. Having this tin can strapped to a pointy end of a rocket full of highly explosive fuel and then lighting the fuse, that is not on my bucket list. I'm really surprised there weren't more fatalities considering all the risks taken to leave our planet. Uh, performing what could be one of the most dangerous activities, pilots can be somewhat superstitious. All kinds of things you do or don't do to make sure the flight or launch go without a hitch. 1961, as cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin was being taken out to his space capsule, he found he needed a bathroom. This could have been something he had drank in the past few hours, or maybe it was just nerves. It had taken some time to get him into his spacesuit and all the bits and pieces hooked up. He was being driven out to the launch pad, and he knew there was going to be a lot of weight placed on his abdomen by the G-forces as he was fired into space. It could get messy. He asked the driver to stop. Gagarin stepped to the back right side of the vehicle, and he did what he needed to do. Today, as cosmonauts and astronauts are being driven out to the launch pad, it is a tradition to stop midway and water the right rear tire of the vehicle. <laughs> this is either a good luck practice or simply a tradition that nobody wants to end. Once this ritual is finished, the technicians have to redo the lower front of their spacesuits. Female cosmonauts have been known to carry a small vial of urine, and they pour this on the tire. They're better there than in the space capsule. Hope you enjoyed tonight's show. If you did, tell their, your friends what they're missing. Let the world know that this is a podcast that maybe they should be listening to. If you didn't like it, what the heck are you doing listening to me in the first place? 
Till next Saturday, this is Chris James for Strange Things. Are you, are you coming to the tree With a strong upper man, the same murder three Strange things that I've been hearing, a stranger would it be If we met at midnight in the hanging tree